What is up guys, this is another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and we're going back to 1997 covering Raw and Nitro from November 10th, 1997 and this is number Raw 233 and Nitro 113. So as usual, we are going to start it off with Raw. And so Raw drew an average rating of a 3.4 for this episode. And it took place in Ottawa, Canada. So this is the night after Survivor Series. So we have the fallout from the Montreal Screwjob. Although none of that really comes into play much here. Um, except for like the crowd because they are in Canada and stuff still. Um, but nothing really major happens or goes on or whatever in this episode related to that. Um, but I believe in a week or two or something, stuff more picks up and related to that or whatever in the episode. But to start off the show, we had DX coming out to a ring to do a promo. And as usual, Rick Rude comes out first and he does an introduction of, or tries to do an introduction, but eventually gets out. Um, but the crowd start, keeps like chanting stuff, not letting him talk. And so he keeps starting to talk and then pauses and they start che are che uh, cheering and everything. And then um, they, at one point, they start cheering bullshit. So they're just going bullshit, bullshit, of course, with the whole screw job type thing and stuff. But they finally introduces them. And so they, all of DX comes out. And so we have Sean, of course, wearing the new um, WWF championship belt because he's obviously the new champion by beating Brett. And so he starts talking first or whatever he's, and mentions that he beat Brett in his home country with his own finishing move. So it was just a bad night for Brett. And now with him having the title that DX is going to be even more harder to deal with in the back. And now that he has like leverage or whatever and stuff will be in the champion. Uh, we want Brett Chant breaks out while this is going on. And then uh, Sean talks a little more saying that he will be a fighting champion and will take on all comers and stuff like that. You know, trying to be like a big baby face guy or whatever and stuff. But of course we know he's um, like a, what they call a chicken shit. And then in response to that, since he says he will be a fighting champion and take on all comers... Ken Shamrock's music plays and he comes out to the ring and so he wants to, to challenge Sean to a title match since Sean ruined um, his or you know messed with his opportunity the week before and then interfered last week and stuff and then it was about this point I did notice that there was a sign out in the crowd I thought it was kind of funny but it said Helmsley mid card for life and I just thought it was funny you know and with the way Triple H's career has gone and now he's a major you know runner and I would somewhat say probably part owner in the WWE and stuff and how he became the champion multiple different times with this said mid card for life. I just thought it was funny. But Sergeant Slaughter comes out in response to Shamrock's challenge and he lays down the law again saying that Sean will have a title match at some point. And so Sean's like, oh, at some point, so not tonight. And he's like, no, not tonight. But Triple H will have a match with Shamrock tonight. And um, Slaughter mentions that he will be out at ringside to keep all of DX away and to make sure no one interferes and stuff. And so that's how that segment ends. So setting up the matches for tonight and then briefly touching on the whole Bret Hart situation. And then from there we go into our first match which is Mark Marrow against Ahmed Johnson. Towards the end of the match, because, you know, a lot of this stuff, nothing really happens or whatever in the matches. But towards the end of it, Ahmed starts setting up to do the, his finisher of the Pearl River Plunge. So obviously, he starts out in a powerbomb type, or it is pretty much powerbomb, but he starts out with doing that. But as he's got Marrow's head between his legs and ready to lift him up, Sable's, like, yelling or something, and it, like, distracts him or something. Like, she's just out on the ringside like she's normally been, but she's just yelling at him and stuff, you know, like normal person would be at this point. And it, he's just, like, looking over at her. And distracted by that. And that gives Ahmed time, or Mark Merrid enough time to get out from under the legs. And then he just punches Ahmed right in the nuts and does it right in front of the referee. So the ref sees it and calls for the bell. And so Ahmed ends up winning by DQ. And then finishing after the match, Mero picks Ahmed up and starts to go or tries to do his TKO finisher, but he can barely do it. So it's just a horrible fail by Mero. He shouldn't have even attempted it, but because Ahmed's so much bigger, it, he couldn't even like do it. He pretty much just fell over with him. Then following after that match, it then shows at ringside that Butterbean is sitting there. So of course the famous boxer, the really big fat guy boxer but they mentioned you know he's there and of course he comes in next year with the whole uh, brawl for all and stuff but he's just shown there wearing a really weird like what they call a cosby sweater or something like that's like a really weird multicolored sweater vet or like sweater <laughs> it just looks horrible but it just shows him sitting ringside and he'll be talked to later in the night 
But then it goes to our light heavyweight tournament match. And this is Taka Michinoku taking on Devin Storm. And I believe Devin Storm is Crowbar. I want to say he becomes a part of Raven's Flock and stuff, I think. I'm not exactly sure on that. But I know he's become somewhat. And I'm pretty sure it's Crowbar by the way he looked. Um, I didn't look it up or anything. Uh, but throughout the match at one point, Taka ends up hitting a springboard moonsault um, to Storm out on the floor. And then at one point, Brian Christopher tries to distract the, uh, Taka because he's out on commentary once again. But eventually gets tired of Taka's moves and stuff. So he gets out and tries to do interference on Taka. But it doesn't work. And Taka ends up hitting the Michinoku driver and gets the pin on Devin Storm. And then as Brian Christopher's mad on the outside that Taka won, Taka goes up, jumps off the top rope, and does a crossbody out onto Brian Christopher and on the floor, ending that segment. Then next up we have JR doing an interview with Goldust in the ring, so Goldust obviously comes out. And this time he's wearing, I forget what they call it, but he's kind of like wearing a robe and almost like pajamas and stuff and slippers and everything. Um, but on his face, so he's got a weird face paint design, but it's got an F on one side, one cheek and U on the other. So it's, you know, F U, but, um, it stands for forever unchained. So it's a part of his whole new gimmick thing that he talked about with Marlene and stuff. And, uh, so it's mentioned how he walked out on his survivor series team and it shows the video that, uh, Vader went to tag him. But when he did, Goldust just walked down the steps, whatever, at ringside and just left him there, giving the chance, I thought that was for that Team Canada to win, because this was obviously the Team America. But I believe America did end up winning in the end. But because of that, Vader ends up coming out to confront Goldust, asking him, you know, why he left the team and no one turns their back on me and everything. And then Goldust says that um, he wasn't clear and an invalid or cleared the wrestle and that he's an invalid so like you know he can't wrestle or do anything but yeah he's in the ring and doing all sorts of stuff but so claiming he has some sort of injury which he could but um it's you know in wrestling stuff so you never know exactly and because of that vader ends up hitting gold dust or attacking gold dust and hitting him with a power bomb and then uh, they start to like go to a break, but before it does, it like ends up cutting back with like breaking news type stuff. And it's backstage in the locker room, and uh, Brett Michael Cole, I think, is there. And he's uh, or some there's a camera in or something. I don't know if Michael Cole's there or not. But it's Bradshaw in like a locker room bathroom, and he's yelling for someone to get help. And Barry Windham's laying out or like laid out on the floor, so someone attacked him and stuff. And so he's yelling for help and everything. So then it goes to a commercial, and we come back with the match of Truth Commission taking on the headbangers and the headbangers actually have doa coming out to help them or be in their corner since the truth commission has the four members and stuff but as the match starts the jackal ends up getting on commentary and he starts talking about the power of persuasion as the stuff he got so he's going into like the whole cult cult leader mode instead of just a member of the truth commission but at one point in the match uh, the interrogator starts to get up on the apron because he's obviously mad about what's going on in the ring and the headbangers are both in at that moment and they end up both doing a double drop kick onto interrogator knocking him off the ring and then the headbangers end up getting the win by the headbangers power bombed each other so the one one headbanger i don't remember which one picked up the other one and did a power bomb on that one onto sniper and then through that they were able to get the pin and so the headbangers win there and then of course a fight breaks out with the um all the truth commission and um the head headbangers in doa and of course interrogators just uh, freaking out going off on all sorts of people and stuff and so trying to control him and then from there we start hour number two and we um it starts off with like footage of the stone cold and owen hart rivalry and you know stone cold being dropped on his head and everything um, but then it goes to Michael Cole in the ring who brings out Stone Cold for an interview. And so Austin, of course, he won the Intercontinental title at some uh, Survivor Series. Um, and as he's talking to stuff, Rocky Maivia or whatever ends up coming out onto the ramp and interrupting. And uh, challenges Stone Cold for the title. And then uh, Stone Cold challenged The Rock in return to one get a haircut. And number two, the flush yourself down a toilet because you're a piece of crap. <laughs> And so I just thought that was funny that he challenged Rock to do those things. And then uh, he says that if you sign the papers, we will have a match. So he, you know, tells Rock to get whatever papers we need to have a match, get him signed, and we will have a match. Next up, we have a match of Los Periquas, and they're supposed to have a match with somebody. I'm not exactly sure, but they come out to the ring, and then before any other opponents end up coming out, it shows JR at ringside talking to Steve Blackman, and they're, like, standing by the commentary table or something. And uh, they're commenting 
uh, mentioning about Steve Backlund being in the Survivor Series match because I guess he took place on the Team America and so he helped them out there and so it's talking about his first match there. And then um, while they're doing that, the Barik was come over and interrupt. And then they all start attacking Steve Blackman. And officials end up coming out and separating all of the, the Barik was from Blackman and stuff. And Blackman at that point has had the upper hand. So he's kind of dominating them in the ring. So as a new guy, he's, you know, being able to take on four or three or four guys, whatever's out at that point. So he's being shown well there. And then from there, we have Michael Cole in the back, and this time he's interviewing the New Age Outlaws, and they don't really say much, just that they have their match coming up, which it then goes into, of the New Age Outlaws taking on the Black, or on both of them taking on Blackjack Bradshaw, and this is what they're calling a bunkhouse brawl, so it's pretty much just a hardcore match or a street fight, whatever you want to call it, because uh, Bradshaw's wearing just jeans and everything, so as they say, that's how you always know it's a street fight, because they're the participants wearing jeans. But so Bradshaw's able to dominate both uh, Billy and and road dog most of the match and he's dominating most of the match until Billy ends up hitting a spinning DDT from the top rope onto a chair and then both uh, Billy and road dog end up climbing up on top of Bradshaw and pinning him and so the New Age Outlaws win that match once again because I assume they're the ones that took out Blackjack Wyndham or Barry Wyndham whatever in the back so that's why they had this match. Then next up we go into the interview of Jeff Jarrett by JR, so it's the video that was like promised last week or something that they never got to but they played today. And um, Jeff Jarrett just throughout the thing just mentioned that he will be the greatest WWF champion ever if he ever gets the opportunity. And then they do a word association with a bunch of with uh, wrestlers and so JR's just saying a whole bunch of names but one that really like stuck out to me was Triple H. And uh, Jarrett said tag along was his associated word. And then from there we go into Michael Cole out at ringside. And he's interviewing Butterbean the, at this point. And I just thought it was interesting. Like I made the note that Butterbean has a really high voice. Like he sounds a lot like uh, Curly from the Three Stooges. Like his like high voice is what it sounded like. I don't know if his, that was his real voice. Because at one point he started getting intense. Because Mark Marrow ends up coming out. And of course interrupting this. And Mark Marrow you know mentions that he's a Golden Gloves boxer. And Butterbean's just an overweight you know tub of lard or something like that just making fun of his size and that Mark Merrick could beat him at any time and that if he keeps looking at Sable the way he does that uh he's gonna beat up Butterbean but Butterbean's like I didn't even like look at her and all this stuff and Merrick's just like you better watch it and everything and so I just thought that was funny because of Merrick trying to challenge Butterbean and then Butterbean's high voice in response and then from there we go into a match of Kama taking on The Undertaker. And so this is kind of an interesting match because I know the, at least I believe if I remember right, uh, Kama and Undertaker are good friends backstage. So usually when people are good friends they have a good match but what was going on wasn't really that interesting. But at one point Kane and Paul Bear end up interrupting on the stage and of course they challenge Undertaker to fight Kane. And Taker ends up responding that he will not face Kane even if everyone in the WWF gets destroyed. That he doesn't care. He will not face his own flesh and blood and all that stuff. And so it never really shows who wins the match or anything. And I think Gama just disappears or something. But from there we go into our main event for the night which is Ken Shamrock taking on Triple H who's coming out of course with DX. So as... DX comes out, of course they're all coming out to the ring, but Sergeant Slaughter interrupts them and sends all the members to the back. So as he said, you know, there would be no DX members at ringside. And so as soon as Triple H hits the ring, Shamrock starts attacking him. So again, he's mad and just trying to get back at Sean and, St and DX and everything. And so he's just taking his outrage on Triple H. And they start fighting around and they fight um, up the ramp and into the crowd a little bit and stuff. And as the match is going on, once again, the crowd starts chanting, we want Brett, of course, because the whole DX thing. And then at one point, uh, Triple H is arguing with Sergeant Slaughter. And I'm not sure about what, because obviously you can't hear it and stuff, but they're just yelling at each other when they go back to the match. And Rick Rude in, ends up coming out and he just stands at the bottom of the ramp. And I don't know why Sar uh, Slaughter didn't do anything, like he didn't like, you know, approach him or stop him or anything. And so Rick Rude was just standing at the bottom of the ramp. Um, and it is mentioned that uh, Shamrock won for his team at Survivor Series and that he was the um, sole survivor. So for the Team America, Shamrock got the win for them. And uh, so Team America did win, as I mentioned earlier. But at one point in the match, uh, Shamrock is, has the upper hand. Rick Rude ends up getting up on the apron to try and help out Triple H. But Slaughter notices. And so he comes running up and pulls uh, Rude off of the apron. And Triple H ends up punching the ref in the face at this point. And uh, soon afterwards, China ends up running out to help. But 
gets caught by Sergeant Slaughter again. And by this point, Shamrock ends up putting Triple H on in the ankle lock, or has an ankle lock on Triple H, whatever. And Shawn Michaels ends up running out, and Rick Rude throws a briefcase to him, to Shawn, and then sh ends up hitting Shamrock in the back of the head with the briefcase again. So, again, taking advantage of Shamrock's like back whatever while in the ankle lock. And Triple H ends up covering up Shamrock, and the ref has come back or whatever, or woken up at this point, and the ref's counting three as the um, show ends but I, you don't see if Shamrock kicked out or anything so it's like who won the match or whatever to end the show but because it cuts out you never see so it's kind of a mystery I assume we'll probably find out next week but I would assume that Triple H won since Shamrock was hit and everything and so that was it for Raw that was a wasn't bad um it probably was it wasn't like the most exciting I especially expected for the night after Survivor Series to be such a really big high energy show and stuff with all the fallout but um I know there was stuff about a lot of the talent or wrestlers and stuff were not rest like didn't wrestle or were sent home or some sort of thing like that because of they were upset about the Montreal screw job so a lot of them didn't show up or something but overall the show wasn't bad like I said it wasn't anything spectacular but it wasn't horrible and then from there we go into Nitro 113 again from November 10th 1997 and this took place in Memphis Tennessee so very famous wrestling territory and it drew an average rating of a 4.0 so it's a whole point higher than Raw on this episode which of course I'm surprised Raw um not surprised Raw went up in the ratings almost by a whole point compared to their past ratings or you know above a three and stuff because of the whole screw job it you know had interest and stuff but I don't think they capitalized on it very well but Nitro did and so the whole thing started out with the NW all of the NWO coming out to the ring which Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff mentioned the week before that all the NWO would be showing up and so this happens here. So all of them come out to the ring and they're all carrying Canadian flags. So of course, referencing the whole Bret Hart thing or in reference to Bret Hart. And as they're coming out, we have the re-debut as they say, or Eric Bischoff gets on the microphone and starts making a big deal of announcing it and saying the re-debut of Kevin Nash. And so Kevin Nash is being rolled out in a wheelchair and uh, Six is pushing it, but as they get up close to the ring, Kevin Nash ends up jumping up and runs up into the ring, showing that he's fine and everything. And he gets on the mic and he says that he will see the Giant at World War Three, so kind of like accepting the challenge, even though it's World War Three. And ever, there's 60 people in the ring, so he's not really accepting it because he's going to be in it no matter what, but he will see the Giant there. And then Bischoff talks and mentions that he signed Bret Hart to be a new NWO member, so he's saying that Bret's going to be a member of the NWO, even though that doesn't turn out correct yet. And then then all of the NWO start trying to sing Canada's national anthem, but it just sounds horrible. And then they start start it again a second time, whatever, pick it up or something, because they're doing a horrible job. But it just sounds absolutely horrible. And then from there, it goes over to commentary, and it shows them, and they're questioning whether Brett is joining the NWO, and it, if he has, what a travesty this is, because you know he comes from a great wrestling family and everything. And he should, you know, have more morals and stuff like that than to join the NWO. But then it goes through over to Mean Gene, um, who does a promo on the ramp. And he's just like, whatever, talks about the hotline that you can call with the whole number or whatever. And he's going to discuss or give the dirt or whatever on a confrontation between Bret Hart and a wrestling promoter. And so the pretty much the fight between Bret and uh, Vince McMahon that happened in the locker room after the screw job. And from there we go into our first match, which is Steven Regal and Dave Taylor taking on Harlem Heat, coming out with Miss Jackie. Nothing really big or important happens throughout the match, but Dave Taylor ends up getting the win with a double underhook suplex on Stevie Ray. So giving the win to Steven Regal and Dave Taylor. Then we got a Nitro Girls dancing going into the match of Disco Inferno taking on Chris Jericho. Um, as the match was going on, the crowd ended up or was distracted by Raven and his flock coming out or walking down the uh or through the crowd and stuff to their seats but Jericho ends up getting the win with the lion tamer on Disco and as Disco's walking out of the ring you know up the aisle way Billy Kidman ends up throwing a drink on him and so Disco grabs hold of him and fights him pulls him over the railing and then hits him with a chart what they call a chart buster which I've never seen him do it before but it's a stunner is what it was <laughs> exactly like a stone cold stunner but it, they call it the chart buster and then sick boy jumps over and of course as he does it because of the drink uh, Billy Kidman threw it he like when he hits the padding his foot slips and he almost falls but he catches himself and then sick boy and Saturn start attacking Disco and beating up on him Scotty Riggs ends up running out and attacking both of them getting them like off of Disco 
And then he starts to go for Raven, but Raven's just standing there, and Scotty's, like, you know, pulling his hand back like he's going to punch him, but he starts, like, shaking his head like he can't, like there's something wrong or something. And so he ends up just walking away, and just of no, Scotty Riggs is wearing an eye patch at this point because of the whole injury Raven did to him to his eye or whatever, supposedly. So he's got an eye patch, so he's Pirate Riggs now. And then from there, we go into a match of Barbarian taking on Glacier. Um, so as the match is going on, soon after, Jimmy Hart ends up walking out or down the ramp or whatever. So he's returning now, and he's managing Barbarian. I don't know what happened to him or if he was just doing stuff backstage, but they're making a big deal that this is his return. And of course, they're in Memphis, which is where he started his wrestling management ship or whatever, participation in the wrestling business. And so at one point, Jimmy ends up getting up on the ropes, yelling at a referee, like he's up on the actual ropes, kind of like bouncing on him and stuff, yelling at the referee. And Glacier notices and hits him with a crown and kicks Cindy Jimmy Hart out onto the floor. And so Jimmy just lays like there, knocked out the rest of the match. And Glacier ends up then ends up hitting Barbarian, who was coming off the top rope doing some sort of move, and he ends up hitting Barbarian with a chronic kick as he's flying through the air, and then gets the pin on him. So Glacier wins the match, and then his whole like the lights go down and starts to do his whole like I would say like dance routine, but his martial arts routine or whatever in the spotlight. And as it's happening, Ming appears behind him in the light and puts on the tongue and death grip onto Glacier to end that segment. Then next up we have Raven that comes into the ring and uh, he starts cutting a promo and he's saying first off that he's sorry for damaging Scotty's eye, he didn't mean to do it or whatever and stuff. And then he explains what he um, stands for, so why he is the way he is of being like a, I think, I don't know if he mentions that he was a rich kid and stuff and that uh, his parents didn't care really much for him and they just gave him stuff. Or I don't remember exactly what the whole thing is, but he talks about how he was a troubled youth and that uh, his misfit follow or he gained misfit followers to help him get revenge in life and stuff and then uh they have a new person that ends up joining into the flock whatever they don't like mention anything the guy just com comes out and gets in the ring with them but it's a big guy with blonde hair and stuff and i had no clue it was but commentary in it ends up saying that looks like van hammer which i've heard van hammer before but i've never seen him or anything and so i guess that's van hammer now joining the flock so he has like eye shadow or stuff around his eyes and he looks all pale and his his hair's all weird and everything. Um, then we get a video package of the feud between Goldberg and Steve McMichael. So just setting up for a match between them at some point. But So it's just a little video. And then it goes into the match of Yuji Nagata, of course, with Sonny Ono. Taking on Alex Wright with, again, his new manager, Deborah. The match is pretty boring and nothing major happens. But at one point on the outside, Sonny Ono ends up walking up to Deborah and just hands her a load of cash or, like, a handful of cash and stuff. And so she starts, like, counting it and everything. And then he grabs a hold of her and kisses her. And she pushes off and then slaps him in the face. And he's all smiling and everything. And that draws Alex Wright's attention. And so he's, you know, distracted by that. And Yuji ends up attacking him from behind and puts on the Nagata lock to get the win. And then that goes into Hour 2 where we have Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff coming out to the ring. And to cut a promo and stuff, and uh, they're saying that during the celebration or whatever, early like, with the whole Canadian flags and singing the anthem and stuff, someone, while that was going on, someone went into their locker room and put a movie poster in there. And the movie, they hold up the movie poster and it mentions that Sting's in it. So Steve Borden or whatever Sting's real name or himself is in the movie. And the movie is uh, called 10 Real Reasons or just Real Reasons the Men Commit Crimes or something like that. I'd never heard of it before. But apparently Sting is in it. And so Hogan's mad because that's uh, Sting intruding on his territory. And so because of that, he ends up challenging Sting tonight to come out. Of course, he's in the ring saying, where is he? Come out, Sting and stuff. And nothing ends up happening. And so then we end up getting the match of Chris Benoit taking on Saturn. And so as Benoit was walking down the highway, Saturn jumped him because, of course, him and the flock are sitting there by the aisle and stuff. And so Saturn jumped on him and started attacking him there. They fight into the ring and Benoit ends up trying to do a roll up on Saturn, but Saturn ends up just like sitting down on him. So it's just a whole weird like moveset. But like I said, Benoit tried to roll him up. Saturn sits down, which pins Benoit down and Saturn gets the win off of that. And then the flock members end up coming in to attack Benoit. But he ends up throwing them all out. It's like all but uh, Van Hammer and Raven. And he throws them all out. And then Benoit starts to go for Van Hammer. But as he's doing that, he gets attacked from behind by Fit Finley, who's ran in, into the ring at this point. And Finley ends up hitting 
Benoit with a tombstone and then leaves the ring. And then all the flock gets back in the ring and they start attacking Benoit. Then we have another Nitro Girls segment going into Mean Gene interviewing Ric Flair. And so Ric Flair comes out and he says that three things are going to happen. Number one, he's going to win World War III and then get another shot at the title. He's going to disable Kurt Henning. And then he's going to beat Lex Luger tonight were the three things I guess that he had. And then uh, so he's talking about he's going to dismantle Kurt Henning and then each member of the NWO. So he's going to, you know, destroy it, try and destroy the NWO. And then once he wins the title after winning World War Three and getting a shot at the um, heavyweight title, once he wins that, he's going to throw a party with all the Nitro girls. And they mentioned how it'd be the 14th time he won the title and everything. And then from there, we get a Halloween Havoc rematch of Eddie Guerrero taking on Rey Mysterio for the Cruiserweight title. And this was a great match, and it had a lot of move and counter move type things. So someone would do a move and someone would counter, and then they counter, and they just do a whole, like every time someone tried to do a move, the other would counter it. But Rey ends up hitting a weird springboard, like, uh, so Eddie has a hold of his hands. Rey jumps up, does a springboard backflip into a, a DDT, as they're calling it. And so it's such a weird move, and it looked just really weird and awkward, but... He did a move of some sort, I guess. And then he starts to go for the Hurricane Rana. But Eddie ends up catching him and drops him onto the ropes. So kind of like choking him or whatever and stuff. And then Eddie goes up and hits the frog splash and gets the pin. And so Eddie is now the new champion and gets his title back. And immediately after that, Dean Malenko ends up coming out to the ring. And he gets in and just stares down Eddie Guerrero and then turns around and walks out. And from there, we go into a Nitro Party video, so it's showing a frat house at UTC, so I don't know exactly Utah technology, call it. I don't know what you, I don't know what UTC is, but it's some frat house there, so a bunch of guys and stuff in a frat house watching Nitro, and they're chanting Nitro and doing a uh, Nitro cheer and everything. But then it goes to a match between Macho Man coming out with Elizabeth against Ray Trailer, and so they start to match by fighting on the outside, so again, continue on with why I noticed that. A lot of the Macho Man matches have fighting on the outside. But Ray ends up throwing Macho Man into the steps. And then they fight around the ring. And he grabs a hold of a chair. And ends up nailing Macho Man in the head. Or doing a chair shot on the head of Macho Man. So again, this was back when they did headshots and stuff a lot. Um, at one point, Ray starts to climb up the top ropes. But Elizabeth goes up and hits his leg. And so Ray gets racked on the top rope. And then uh, he falls off there. And Macho ends up hitting him. And then goes up and does an elbow drop on him to get the pin so macho man wins there and then he starts doing more elbow drops so he hits three more in total and attacks the ref in between that time and stuff and elizabeth runs to the back and comes running back out with spray paint but i don't ever see them spray it on so i don't know what the whole point of that was but as the, it's cutting away and goes commentary they mentioned that the decision for the match was reversed because of the actions that macho man did so ray ended up getting the win for the match then we get our last Nitro Girl segment for the night, and it goes into the match of Kurt Henning taking on DDP, a rematch from a week or, or two or so weeks ago. Um, very late in the match, DDP goes to do a diamond cutter, but Kurt Henning ends up sliding out of the ring, and as he does, he grabs his title and starts walking towards the back like he's not going to continue on with the match, but he does end up returning, or DDP goes for him. I don't remember exactly. And, uh, of course, Henning starts attacking the injured ribs of DDP, because, again, DDP has some sort of rib injury. And he's got the rib tape around him that I remember him very clearly wearing uh, back in the day. Like, I always remember DDP wearing the rib tape. Um, then DDP goes, tries to go for another diamond cutter, but Henning counters once again. And he grabs a hold of the title that's now sitting on the apron. And he hits DDP in the ribs with it. And so DDP wins by DQ because of that. And so that's just how that match ends. And they go straight into Ric Flair taking on Lex Luger. And so throughout the match, Flair starts attacking Lex Luger's left leg again, setting up for the figure four. And he eventually does this. So he slaps on the figure four, but Luger is able to roll through the move or roll the move around or, whatever, or roll them around to get to the ropes. And so it breaks the hold. And then Luger starts to set up for the torture rack. But Kurt Henning comes running out into the ring. And as he's in the ring, Luger has picked Ric Flair up into like a press, whatever they call it, where they just pick him straight up over the head. And he tosses Ric Flair onto Kurt Henning. And it's like Kurt or Flair then notices he's touching Kurt Henning. And so Flair starts beating up on Kurt Henning and ends up chasing him to the back. And so the match ends a d d uh, disqualification because of Kurt Henning. But I don't know who wins there because I don't know 
who uh, Henning attacked first to get the to see who would be the one to win or whatever. And then that goes into our last segment of the night, which that Flair and Lex Luger was our main event. But then it goes to Hogan and Eric Bischoff coming out to the ring. And so once again, they're calling out Sting to come face him, and they're doing it for like a couple of seconds or a minute or something. And Sting eventually does drop down from the ceiling, and he goes up into the ring, and he just does a stare down with Hogan. But before anything can happen, that NWO comes running in and they start attacking on Sting. So it's all of them beating up on Sting, doing different moves. Hogan ends up doing many different, many uh, leg drops. I don't, I wasn't able to count to see how many he did, but he did. I'd say definitely more than like three or four. And then just I noticed before. <laughs> We in here, Conan was wearing uh, sandals and he had white socks on. So they were like weird sandals that I remember people used to wear all the time in the 90s. I don't know exactly how to describe them or anything, but they were like really cheap sandals. And then he had white socks on with them. So it just looked super dorky. But that is how Nitro ended. And so overall, the shows, um, they weren't bad. They weren't necessarily good or like action packed or anything. I was trying to think which one I liked better. I would say they're probably about the same. Like, I can't really think one's better over the other. I'd say they're probably about the same this week. Both dealing with, uh, of course, the Montreal screw job and stuff related to Bret Hart. So, um, that has a connection with them and stuff. But that's going to be it for the Monday Night Rewind podcast this week, where we went back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and covered Nitro 113 and Raw 233. So, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, don't forget you can follow the podcast here on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever you want to call it. And you can find it at SoundCloud as well. So either of those ways to listen to the podcast version. Or you can find it on YouTube. I Awesome Nerd Show, our channel. And you can see the it's like a video thing. But it's just a picture with the podcast going on over the top of it. So you can listen to it that way as well. And you, you can listen to the past episodes. Because I don't have all the time or whatever on SoundCloud. So I have to take some off. So you can listen to older ones if you want to go back and listen there at YouTube. But if you are there, don't forget to subscribe and all the other stuff. But I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.